the whole war was about 40 days. Just a second. United States Department of Veteran Affairs. And I want everybody to know these numbers and tell the truth. United States Department of Veteran Affairs, September 10, 2002. Office of Performance Analysis Integrity Data Information System, Gulf War Casualty Report. As of May 2002, ladies and gentlemen, the Gulf War Casualty Count is broken down into two things, and it's extremely important to understand this. Those of us that participated between August of 1990 and October and November of 1991, the number of eligible veterans now is 572,833. That's how many of us participated in the active combat phase. 206,861 as of May 2002 had submitted claims for service-connected direct combat injuries. 206,861 out of 572,000. The United States Department of Veteran Affairs, as of May 2002, and this doesn't include me because mine came afterwards, has awarded permanent disability for combat injuries during Gulf War I to 159,238 of our sons and daughters. Not the 766 that you see in the World Almanac. And this number is going up astronomically. 160,000 from a 100-hour war are now permanently disabled. Who the hell wants to go to war? And they tell these kids that all their job is they're going to come out of war safe. No, ladies and gentlemen, you go to war, your job is to kill, and you will die. Well, over 8,000 are dead out of that group. And that only, that, the 8,000 are dead only counts those individuals that have been awarded service connection from the Department of Veteran Affairs. Now, it even gets worse than that, ladies and gentlemen. The United States has deliberately and willfully continued to send military troops into the Persian Gulf region since August of 1990 and since the fall of 1991. Now, there's been no active combat over there since March and April of 1991. But we shot the place up with uranium munitions. We contaminated with hazardous materials. We blew up chemical and biological stockpiles and nuclear reactors. We had the oil well fire set on. Iraq did use chemical and biological weapons on us, ladies and gentlemen. He absolutely did. But, you know, again, we gave it to him. Ladies and gentlemen, the real Gulf War casualty count as of May 2002, and it's going up astronomically, for all individuals that have been employed in the Gulf War region, Persian Gulf region, since August of 1990, 285,292 of our finest have put in for permanent VA disability. I'm going to repeat that. 285,292. And the Department of Veteran Affairs has permanently awarded permanent disability to over 221,502 as of May of 2002. And that number, ladies and gentlemen, is approaching of now at a quarter of a million. One third of the Gulf War force from Gulf War I is permanently disabled. A quarter of a million of our finest. This is the ultimate local issue. Because when those kids come back, or those family members come back, either male or female, their family is destroyed. They can no longer participate effectively in their community, and they need all the resources you can potentially give to them, both psychologically and physiologically. Reality of war is you go to war and you kill, and you do die. The current report of what's happening in the Gulf War I, ladies and gentlemen, in a report before Tony Principi, the Secretary of the VA, Christopher Shays, Bernie Sanders, Dr. Sushil Sharma from the, v from the Gen United States General Accounting Office, Denise Nichols, was two weeks ago they reported the General Accounting Office, a branch of the United States Congress, reported that Gulf War vets were dying at a rate of over 130 a month. 
reality of war is you kill and you die. And we're sending these kids in with defective equipment, with inadequate training, into a totally contaminated area. And the reason I know it's totally contaminated is real simple. The epidemiology is right here. I have an additional 60,000 plus that are now ill in a permanent disability from going into an area to sit. There's no act of combat. Which means that the only reason these numbers can go up is because the contamination that is there from deliberate U.S. actions, Iraqi actions, is getting everybody. In reality, you die. Now, in 1994 and 1995, after all of our reports, I was tasked to be the depleted uranium project director for the United States Army Department of Defense, which means by directive I was tasked to determine how to clean up the environment after a DU impact, how to make vehicles operational safe in combat, and how to provide all the education and training that has been mandated over and over again by direct order. I finished it in 1995. And even though I finished in 1995 when I got the order and the order's up here, they didn't give me any budget. They just said do it. We did it. We did it. And the training and education we put together in 1995 has never been implemented to this day. And the medical care required for friendly fire casualties in my team and thousands upon thousands of American warriors, thousands upon thousands of coalition warriors, thousands upon thousands of Iraqi warriors, but ladies and gentlemen, the children of the world in Vieques, Puerto Rico, in Indiana, in Minneapolis, in Nevada, in Florida, in Scotland, in Korea, in Okinawa, has never been provided as directed. And the reason is, ladies and gentlemen, when you use these weapons, and you know the health and environmental effects, if you do not look for the health effects in the warrior by providing medical care and treatment for them, you will find no correlation between the exposures and the adverse health effects because you don't look. Today I'm here to implore you, to ask you, as an army officer, as a medical officer, as an American, as a patriot, and got to understand, I'm to the right of Rush Limbaugh, okay? You need to understand that. I'm a warrior. If I'm ordered to go to war tomorrow and I have a viable threat against my nation, ladies and gentlemen, I'll nuke them in a heartbeat. You need to understand that. Because in the peace movement, or whatever you're working on, you can't look at these guys that are making these decisions and ask those guys to comply with morality and ethics. And if you have a viable threat, you can't turn your back. But right now, we don't have a viable threat in Iraq. Now, I had not only responsibility for nuclear bombs, chemical warfare, I had responsibility for the captured equipment project in the Gulf War, which means I did the assessment, along with my colonel, on Iraq's military capability because we collected and assessed all of their weapon systems. Now, some of you understand this, but the systems Iraq has could be taken out with an M60 machine gun. You've seen the weapon systems I sent back to Fort Benning. You've worked with them and shot them up, correct, Sergeant? Or is it a lieutenant? Are you an officer, sir? Oh, you're a sergeant. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and you could do it. Now, when we blew all this stuff, we blew up what his weapon systems are, started in December of 1990, continued on. Military teams that I worked with went in and blew them up again and got us all exposed. And then Scott Ritter, God bless Scott Ritter, and his team of UNSCOM, he's a good friend of mine, they went in and blew those suckers up up until 1998. Now, in 1998, even though what you hear, UNSCOM was not or thrown out by Iraq. They were ordered out by the United States military. Absolute happen. And they were full of spies. <laughs> and they were in there to find out what everything was happening because, ladies and gentlemen, I trained them. When you go to war and you use weapon systems that contaminate air, water, and soil, when you go to war, you use weapon systems and techniques and combat tactics that our troops are not prepared to do right with, which I means they're not educated and trained. They don't know how to do it and they don't have equipment to survive. 
When you go to war and you refuse to provide medical care for the health effects of not only that nation, but the Balkans and Okinawa and all over, when you go to war and you can't clean up the environment, you can't provide medical care, war is obsolete and peace must reign on earth. Period. You have no options. I'm an old warrior, and what I see as far as the troops being prepared for combat is a disaster. I'm an old warrior, and what I see as far as being able to clean up the environment, it's unable. I developed the procedures for the U.S. Army on the cleanup of uranium contamination, low-level radioactive materials. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you it can't be done. It took us three months to clean up 24 vehicles of U.S. friendly fire and ship them back to Barnwell, South Carolina at Savannah Riverside, and it took th another three years for them to clean those things up and make them ready for disposal. And we've got thousands upon thousands of contaminated vehicles stretched all the way across the earth. When you go to war, you have to distinguish between the weapon systems you have and are they indiscriminate killers and do they contaminate air, water, and soil forever. Ladies and gentlemen, today our leaders have decided that the sole purpose is to kill. And they don't care what the weapon systems are and what the health and environmental effects are. You ain't never going to win against these guys if you come up with morals and ethics, because they don't care. If you're going to stop a war, if you're going to make sure that it's taken care of, you have to come at them in their own laws and their own rules. It's the only way it works. The peace movement. I'm an army officer. I'm out here to teach. I don't belong to any group or any organization. I just care about taking care of the troops. In 1970, between combat missions in Vietnam, you have to understand they didn't really stop, but I got to sleep. And I was sleeping on the floor of my commanding general's office, General Frank Elliott, U.S. Air Force, commander of the uh, 307th Bomb Wing in, during the Gulf War, or during Vietnam War. And what he told me that day, and I learned, was something very important. We were sound asleep between combat missions in the middle of the night, and you understand, we were going out and killing. My job at that time was strictly to kill and to live somehow. And we were sound asleep on his office floor, and this colonel came in and stepped over one, fell over one of the sergeants who was sleeping by the door. And that sergeant, he grabbed the sergeant, picked him on up, and said, what are you sleeping on duty for? And you're sleeping in the command post, you can't sleep here. Well, he didn't know General Elliott was sitting at the desk in the corner and I was sleeping on the floor behind the general. The general came out of his chair, and he's six foot two, about 200 pounds, not an ounce of fat on this guy. I mean, he's a real honest guy general. He stepped over me, he stepped over the other guys, and he grabbed the colonel by the scruff of the neck, took a hold of him and said, these are my guys, they're sleeping when I told them to sleep between combat missions, and you will always take care of the troops, and I will always take care of the troops. And he took that guy by the scruff of the neck, turned him around, put his size 12 combat boot all the way up that guy's arse, and threw him down the stairs out of the command post, and the guy landed on a heap. And General Elliott turned to every one of us, and he said, Sergeants, everybody, I want you to remember, you always take care of the troops. Well, General Elliott and I stayed friends through my entire life. And he died about two years ago, and he retired as a commanding general of Shunit Air Force Base in Illinois, where I live. He had an influence on my life from the time that I was 19 years old up until two years ago. That's over 30 odd years. And one of the last things he told me, asked me before he died was, Doug, hey, Sergeant Rock, are you always taking care of the troops? And my comment back to General Elliott was, yes, sir, I will. Well, he's in heaven now, and I'm going to be sure and follow his directive, because I don't want no lights of bolting, bolts of lightning coming out of him. I need your help. Ladies and gentlemen, right now, you need to come together with all the groups. Whether you're looking at individuals that are extremely conservative or very to the right or very to the left, you need to come together with all groups and find a common thread. And that common thread is peace.